Hey there. Welcome. Jeff, so we, good, good to be here with you. Thank you. Likewise, likewise. And uh, we're going to be talking about the future of cyber. Uh, that's a hard topic, kind of a softball in some ways, because who knows and predicts the future. Uh, but we're going to try to do that a little bit today. And the premise is that most of the CISOs and the people in both industry and government are so focused on today that they have all the work just to get through the end of the day in patches and updates and checking the people, running bug bounty programs. Yes. Who's thinking about the future? So the premise is, what should we do today to start preparing two years from now, five years from now? There's a research that should be going on. And if so, what would you do if you didn't have any limits on budget, if you didn't have any limits on time and people to prepare for that future. So to start, Jeff, why don't you, what does a system, a well-run, well-integrated defense system look like today? What's the starting point or the baseline? Sure, all right, so um, just to kind of backtrack a little bit, cybersecurity, the future of it, um, where do you start, where do you end? Uh, it's kind of squishy, so, I thought the only thing that's going to survive this discussion would be the frameworks that we work in. Tools will come and go. Things like artificial intelligence will come in. It'll be leveraged, but it's leveraged within a framework. So to me, th the way we operate today is with the cyber kill chain. Uh, thank you, Lockheed Martin. Um, and when you do the cyber kill chain, what really makes that work is is that, is that you catch something on the delivery phase, right? Great, hooray, you're done, right? No. You take it offline, you put it onto an outside box, you tickle it until you figure out what links four, five, six, and seven are gonna do. Where, where a high-performing organization starts to really work is you take a look at that cyber kill chain and you say, I have a vulnerability in the area of link five. Then you look back to something called CDM. You guys know what CDM is, right? Hopefully the answer is yes to that. Continuous diagnostics and mitigation. So we're gonna have a screen that literally is just a, uh, a common operating picture for how my cyber defenses are working. The heavy lifting and the high level work will be t t taking the kill chain links, corresponding them into the environment, knowing where Things have to get fixed, and when you play that game, it's easy to look at a program manager and say, okay, link six is broken, link five is broken. We, it is a great thing we caught this on link three, but you need to do patching right now. You need to change your environment right now, and it helps us get to that compelling story. Excellent, excellent. So that's really a good description of a high-functioning defense of where we are today. Now, going to the future, the threats are gonna determine what kind of defenses you need. So if we can visualize threats, do you have any projections or vision of where threats are? I know we, we talked about AI sure. and, and some of those 32 different facets of AI, that yes. any one of which can provide a threat. But Jeff, what do you think? So, so for the AI piece, right now, um, the question I keep asking myself is, can, a, can AI produce a trusted system? One that I can put a defense on automatic. That's a, that's a pretty terrifying thing, right? We all know back in the days when you set up firewall rules, said when this happens, block all outside traffic. Well, so your opponent just said, hey, I got an easy way to do denial of service. I'll just send that stuff to you. And you just literally took yourself off, off the map. So. Getting to a point where AI matures enough to be able to trust the decision that it makes is something that I'm looking forward to. We know it's an arms race. We know at some point in time, the adversary is gonna be coming at me at AI, computer, totally synchronized speeds, and the only way to defend it is to have that in my OODA loop, right? Observe, orient, decide, act. When machines are against human beings and the timing is that tight, you don't have a choice. Perfect, perfect. 
And, and in these facets, neural networks, Bayesian belief networks, you're dealing with structured and unstructured data, and you're, you're trying to do this in machine learning or even deep learning methodologies. Uh, the tools that are out there today, uh, they're just getting started to apply to the cyber program. And so, so if those are the threats, and possibly even throw in quantum computing, which in five years can be a reality, uh, yeah. and there are work going on there today, what are the defenses against those future threats? So I think when we start looking at um, identifying what, what the threats are, things like AI are going to will really bubble up to the surface quickly, but they'll bubble up in more than one way. The way people traditionally think of AI working is they're going to give you the answer, right? But to me, it, the human brain still is an incredibly powerful thing. AI could be used to visually display it in a way that a human brain is going to be able to wrap its head around it and go, that one is really different. That's an outlier. Let me go pull that thread. That's probably the near term where AI is really going to rock, rock for us. Yeah. And, and, and you can, today we can tell whether a picture's a dog or a cat. Uh, maybe in five years we want to tell whether a, an actor on my network's a good guy or a bad guy. Yes. And, and, and go in that direction. Well, Today we do a lot of work on the cloud, and I think we've heard this morning uh, a lot about the cloud and where it's going. Where do you think the security for endpoint is going to be? Endpoint's where people get into networks. That's where a lot of the damage is done. That's uh, where a lot of the threat really is focused. Mm -hmm. Where do we need to do for endpoint security? All right, so um, <clears throat> this is Jeff Eisensmith speaking here. So in an ideal world, um, my endpoints would be trusted systems. Right, um, and I've done some trusted system programming. It takes about 20 times longer than anything else to do. Uh, and so in the real world, there's this real-time pressure to market, right? It has to get there. If I get there late, I'm gonna miss it. Someone else is gonna beat me to it. But I think we're gonna have to flip that paradigm to people are gonna really start to think about security as a value. This is really big on the Internet of Things. And I, and I tried talking to a group of people about, would you spend more money on a Wi-Fi router if it came to you with a unique password, not the one that always comes on the box? So whether you do anything with like, it or like not. Like password. That's probably not the one you want to use. Yes, yeah, exactly, right. right? And people thought, well, you know, would I really spend another you know, 40 bucks on a router when I can change the password myself, which, by the way, they're not going to do. Um, and then I said, well, what about a car? Would you buy an autonomous car that costs you $10,000 less, but they short sheeted the bet on security? I think people usually think about that one a little bit more, yeah. right? Because there's, there's more skin in the game. No, no, that's a great, great point. And, and when we start looking at endpoint security, uh, we're looking at more than just an operating system security. You're looking at, can you secure the BIOS? Yes. And how do you have some knowledge that you're operating with the original work. Uh, attacks are not going to just be on the operating system. They're going to be throughout the system. And are we doing research now that can, can help protect the machines at the BIOS level? And, and that's a critical, critical juncture. Yeah, so I like, you know, way, way back when there was a paper I read, I think it was at a University of California, one of the schools there, that, that talked about, this was old school. There was a Unix machine that they loaded um, a virtual machine underneath of the operating system. And it was really, it was very, very novel because what they did was uh, when you went to put a platter into um, the disk drive to load a new operating system, it did everything you thought it was going to do. It turned on the lights, the fan turned on, made all the correct number of beeps, turned itself off, gave you all the right screen readings, and guess what was still there? the virtual machine sitting under the brand new operating system you just loaded. So to me, some of the most exciting work is having what I would call silicon anchors sitting deep in the chips, chipsets that let you know without any shadow of a doubt that you're actually touching the silicon. There's nothing between you and that chipset. And you're talking my language. I love that. And, and I also think you've got to be in ingenious in the combination of hardware and software. If you go one route and one route only without combining the two and the power that both can bring, we're going to be in trouble in the future. Agreed. 
agree so, completely. So let me shift it to uh, multi-factor authentication. How do we know who you are and where you are and that you're the right actor on this machine? And we've heard a little bit about this this morning. Interesting subject. What's the future of multi-factor authentication? Hmm. Well, uh, hopefully it is who you are and what you know, right? Uh, right now we're with we use what you have, which will, which will be a token, a cryptographic token, and, and what you know. Um, and I have always made the argument that once you start using things like bio, biometrics, um, the key space can be really large depending upon the sensor that's actually testing that. So um, I think, one, if we start to go into biometrics as part of the multi-factor, it could be everything from voice to speech inclination, to cho choice of vocabulary, if they really pinch your heart, what is the reaction gonna be? All that stuff that gets you to a much stronger place without you having to have something in hand. Yeah, I, I've had to, been taking some MOOC courses trying to keep up to speed with the, the technology that's out there today. And when you take the exams, they, they test your typing speed hmm. because that's a fingerprint you have. Uh, and if you have the right typing speed to type in a phrase they want you to type, then they think that's you and you can take the exam. Uh, I don't know how to type any different than I do already, so I, that's a pretty good factor in there. And, and uh, my family is all excited about the iPhone 10 coming out yes. uh, because it's got dual cameras for a stereoscopic image and it can take a three-dimensional picture of your face to make sure that's really you. Uh, and I think they're excited. They want to be able to turn it off because they don't want their picture taken. But, you know, that's, uh, that's what young ladies uh, are a little self-conscious, I think. But the thing that I love about that is, um, so, so many of you have phones that will turn on notifications, right? The phone is smart enough that um, it will know if it's your face or not. And if it isn't your face, it, it doesn't show the notifications. So I think I see people sneaking up on the phone to, to, to actually see, see it about. Yeah. And I love the, the 3D picture because you can't just take a picture. I can't take your picture and then use that on your phone later this, to hold up a picture of a picture in front. You've got you to have the depth perception, which I think is uh, pretty good. Well, that, that gets into wh what technologies can you see is changing the game that we should be working now. Now, now I'll, I'll throw out a couple. Uh, uh, what about blockchain? Uh, the blockchain used for identification. Uh, we're doing research there right now for our 3D printing business. Uh, mainly for file integrity, yes. but it also shows that, you know, if you, you can make sure that that's me sending the command to the printer to print this specific part for a system that I have authority to print for. It, and and, and, and we're, we're hoping that that gives you some ability for file integrity in a print business that certainly could apply to are you able to access files in the uh, computer world or the network world. Yes, yeah, so, so one of my famous sayings of the, of the people that know me is never waste a good crisis. Um, and you look at digital coin in the government. I worked for the FBI for a while and have run-ins with Treasury. And, and you know, not being able to control the currency was a big shock to us. So this is kind of a crisis in a way, but it's also a great opportunity. And I am 100% with you. And, and, and finally, for encryption. Where's the state of the art in encryption? That's important, you've heard it up here that if you're gonna protect data at rest, if you're gonna protect data in motion, you, you better have it encrypted, wrapped up in a container, Docker. Where's that gonna go? Follow more of the same or are there other things coming? All right, so I'm gonna be a buzzkill here. Um, when we get to the point where we have quantum computing, where it really gets effective, um, all the encryption that you've been using for a long time just really isn't gonna be meaningful. Um, and you better start thinking now about what is it that I've encrypted and thought was going to be good for 50 years, and it's not going to be 50 years. Yeah, we're, we're, we're actually getting briefed next week on a photonic encryption scheme that's using entangled photons to create million-bit keys. They've been created in seconds and, and sent to two ends over fiber optic wire. Com you can't hack into it because if you do get into the fiber optics and try to pick up the key stream, right. it changes the key stream. Yeah. And it won't be, won't, be, won't be breakable. So I think that's exciting. I think it's a fascinating world and there's a lot of potential out there. But the problem is if we don't start today, we're not gonna be ready for the future. Great. It's gonna get 
the hackers will be there before we get there. So the final question, are we investing enough now to prepare for a cyber future? Hmm. Okay. Um, <laughs> the answer is... Um, I know that's a loaded question. Yes, it is. It's, it's so, so hard. I would like to see more investment, but at the same time, um, you know, where do you start? So there are key technologies, um, quantum computing, being able to lock our stuff down with meaningful encryption in the days that are coming are key. Getting to a point of a trusted system. So the larger the operating system, it becomes almost impossible to, to get to a trusted system. Are there ways to trust key components in that to get you there? Those are all areas where I would make, make some serious investments. All right, and I'll just add that it's not going to be done by government alone. Private oh, industry sure. has got to join in. There's going to be nonprofits, and there's some great research nonprofits in this country of ours that are willing to step up to the plate. And we have to coordinate, we have to communicate, and forums like this is a great place to do it. Agreed. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you very much.